just referencing back to the housekeeping, and the, so this is globalisation uh, copyright issues. Uh, the other session on rural issues is next door, uh, and then the other ones here, depending on where you were supposed to be. So uh, if there's someone who almost needs no introduction to a room like you, it's David Farrer. So almost, I have heard him introduced or described once as, no, not Cameron Slater, the other guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> And he's going to facilitate your session on copyright. Uh, you, don't, you really don't need to know any more, except he was, what, fourth? Are you, are you up from fourth on the media's most important list? Have you, did, did you peak at four? Or? I think that was definitely a peak. Peaked and it shows four. how you should never believe any list, the list of publishers. Hi, Toby. <laughs> All right, I'll hand over to David to run the session for you. Um, thanks, James. Um, first of all, just on housekeeping, everything I say is subject to copyright, so you can't quote more than 10% of anything I say. Uh, no, sorry, that was the joke. Look, you're not here to hear from me. We're actually here... Sorry? A Creative Commons license, so everything said here, indeed. Look, we're really here to hear from everyone here about their views on copyright in the digital age. But I want to start by taking us to a very brief history lesson. For 302 years ago, the first copyright law was passed. And sadly, I think copyright laws have, in modern ages, been seen to be bad things. But I actually quite like the Statute of Anne, which was passed in 1610. Because what it did was three things. The first is, up until then, or in fact it stopped 10 years earlier, Copyright was held effectively by the Stationers Guild. You were not allowed to publish anything unless you did it through them. They had a monopoly effectively on printing and publishing. It probably sounds ideal to certain Hollywood studios, um, I'd suggest. But actually, the copyright law said copyright belongs to creators and authors, not to the publishers, which I think was a great um, innovation that came about. The second thing it did was say the term of copyright, and, and you may not believe this or it's changed so much, was 14 years. Plus, if you were still alive, you could apply for another 14 years. Um, it perhaps does indicate where we've got to that it was only a few years later that there were battles to try and get this extended. And in fact, a couple of court cases arguing that copyright for duration of your natural life was in the common law. And the courts ruled it was, but then the House of Lords later overturned it. So where we're at today is there is no common law right for copyright. It is saying created by parliament by statute. And it's about getting that balance of rights. And what we've seen, I think, in the last 10 years is a global war basically with the internet as the battleground over copyright. And all our favorite acronyms have come out, ACTA, SOPA, PIPA, TPP. If it doesn't have an acronym, it's obviously not evil. And on those acronyms, TPP, I'd like this not to be a session about the TPP. Issues in the TPP certainly can come up, but we do have a TPP-specific forum tonight, um, which people can come along to, etc. So let's try not to turn this just into just about the TPP, because it's actually an opportunity to be more than that. New Zealand government has said in 2013 they're going to review the Copyright Act. That can be one of two things. One can be a technical review, saying, look, this is the act at the moment. Can we enhance it a bit? Can we amend it to make it work a bit better? The other sort of review is what I call a first principles review, where it's actually having that fundamental conversation about what are the rights that people should have that are creators, that are users, that are academics, that are libraries? Because I think in this battle we've been having, we often do overlook it should be a balance of rights. Often people like myself that get portrayed as anti-copyright, when in fact that couldn't be further from the truth. It is very important that you have the economic incentives for creators that they can actually uh, make a commercial return off that. So one of the things I'd be keen to hear from people today is their views on what should be the rights and copyright. Are they rights that are ex exclusively to creators? Are they rights exclusively to users, like, for example, fair use quoting? Or are they shared rights where there might have to be uh, some middle ground there? 
So it's very much about hearing from people here. We do not need to get consensus, which I think would be difficult in this session. We don't have to try and write a new copyright act here and now. What it's about really is identifying what the issues are, what they think uh, should be looked at in the review of the Copyright Act so that people at the appropriate time next year can know more, can go forth, do submissions, and hopefully have what I don't think we've ever had in this country, which is that big debate about copyright being a proactive issue rather than a reactive issue saying, we don't like what's being proposed from Hollywood. Uh, so with those introductory comments, uh, if you put your hand up, I'll um, take speakers. Sir. Uh, microphones will appear magically. <laughs> no, but we can hear you. On another housekeeping matter, there is a Google Doc for this session. If you go to NetHui program, it's linked off there um, for NZ1. It's named after it. It would be great if one or more people actually use it to take notes uh, of the session. There is no one scribe, you're all scribes today. So those of you online, feel free. Just on the issue about media taking things off Facebook, um, as happened to me, I emailed them and asked how much they're willing to pay me and got $150 for a, for a photo from Sunday News once. So if it does happen, send a polite email. You probably will actually end up be, being able to negotiate something. Next, David. don't, you will have to suffer what the conglomerates and the corporates and so on and so forth give you. And that is really what I urge you about. I'm not going to talk about getting back to first principles, although that would be nice. Uh, but I really think that you've got to have your say, and I think that this session is a very, very good starting point. Thank you very much. Down the back. I also think it's very important 
um, to talk about the fact that in last year's Net Hui, we talked about how people had, could bring their own devices to work, or people were supplied with netbooks, iPhones, smartphones from work. Now, who owns the copyright of, this, of your tweets, of your pictures? that you take with a work phone, your work or you. Um, and you know, sometimes that there might be some sort of disputes with that in terms of between you and your workplace because some people sign agreements, um, employment agreements that say everything is owned by the company, even whatever you do in your private time. So some of you might want to discuss that. So, yeah. There's a race from the left, from the right, <laughs> left ones. Um, I, I think it's quite uh, unimaginative to try and base our current copyright law off, um, off what was made in the days of uh, Knights of the Round Table and uh, printing presses. If, if, I, um, if I have a song or a book that I want published and distributed around the world in as short a time as possible, I'm not going to get on my horse and ride down to the nearest printing press. I'm going to uh, somehow get it into my computer and then the magic happens from there. It copies itself. And when we're in a world where uh, information copies itself, how can you then try to legislate to prevent it copying itself? That, that seems uh, almost impossible. Um, just briefly answering the question, I guess. Um, first of all, I think the past gives us a very good guide to to some of the problems that, have, uh, that we're facing now. Um, before the printing press, everything was copied by hand, and there was a culture of uh, the right to copy things. You didn't have a copyright. If you received a copy of a document, you could, if you wanted a copy, you had to write it out by hand. So the, the real disincentive to copying was the physical labor in doing it. So now we're faced with a, with a society where that disincentive has gone away, all of the copying is automatic, but um, we've, lost, we've lost this right to be able to look at uh, and, and we're going to say comment on, but actually distribute the same ideas that we receive. So we've kind of lost, through, through copyright, we lose our right to our own culture. And this is one of the things I'm upset about, is the fact that if everything is copyright for 90 years or 100 years, suddenly the, you can't really use the things in your own culture without without being, them being ripped off, um, oh, sorry, ripped away from you um, w without much consideration. For example, I mean, I had a YouTube account. Um, I put up around 150 videos of my, of my own content. I used things like Creative Commons Music for backing, and I tried to use, and, and, um, use Creative Commons material. Um, in one situation, I was commenting against the, B the BSA, the Business Software Alliance. Um, I, I was doing what I believed was fair use. Um, as a result of them complaining to YouTube, um, I got a DMCA and that took down not only the video that they were concerned about, but the entire collection of videos. So this is, it comes down to free speech. So I mean, uh, free speech is being limited by, by laws like the DMCA and um, copyright laws, laws here, um, and that's taking away our, our right to our own culture. And just before we go to Donald, we've heard Creative Commons mention a couple of times. Quick show of hands, who here has actually licensed something using a Creative Commons license? Not bad. Donald. I'm hopeful that we'll, we have a fantastic uh, review opportunity coming for the, the Copyright Act, and I'm, I'm just hopeful that maybe ourselves as innovators and users in this space may stay ahead of the law. Um, we have licenses, Creative Commons, there's lots of software license variety out there. And they're good, they're powerful tools. But surely at heart this is a business model problem and an economic model problem. Um, how do we engender in a, in a world where the, the fabric of everything that we communicate with is a copying machine? as Lessig said last year, how do we still enable people to make money? And there's a lot of experimentation going on, whether it's subscription models and Spotify's finally come to New Zealand, right? Or there's Netflix in the US, very popular models. Or do we still prefer this sort of um, 
um, you know, get a small sample and, and bite-sized chunks and purchase in bite-sized chunks. We're seeing a lot of innovation just now, and I think we should be cautious not to sort of steam in and try and uh, legislate or control through other means until we've had a chance for that ecosystem to innovate and evolve and develop. And who knows, we may actually arrive at a solution ourselves where people feel there's enough balance between exposure to content and reward for producing that content. So I, I guess I just urge caution. I think with the, the judge's decision to throw out, was it the Apple, the Google Oracle case or the Apple, or yeah. what, one of the internal cases in the US just last week, because they sort of said, this is nonsense. You're, you're abusing the legal system for what's a business dispute. And that gives me hope as well, even in a country and a jurisdiction like the US. Yeah, a question people might want to think about, we've just heard about new business models, which personally I think is a huge part of the future. But if people have views on tape, iTunes is now, you can buy almost any song in the world legally off iTunes. Some people still torrent, get them for free, they can buy them legally, they just choose not to. What remedies should be available to the producers of that content where they've made available for, uh, for sale at what some may call a reasonable price, but people are choosing not to. Um, should it just be tough, this is the internet, it's a giant copying machine, or should, should there be um, consequences, you know, what rights should those content creators have? Um, and next, Alistair. Um, following on from what Donald says, I think um, I'd just like to draw attention to a recent court precedent in the, which, which um, sorry, I'm Alistair from Scoop, we're, we're a news organisation, and um, we're particularly interested in copyright in related to, relation to news, because news is, is increasingly um, uneconomic to produce. Um, and the Meltwater case, which is in the States, essentially has held, contrary to what we commonly thought the law was, that it is in fact possible to be charged for either being distributed or for distributing or receiving a link to a piece of material if that is being done for commercial purposes. It also holds that if a website states on its terms and conditions that it can only be used for, for, for private purposes and not for commercial purposes, then a organisation which uses that website for commercial purposes can in fact be directly asked to sign an end user licensing agreement by the publisher. Now, practically speaking, this changes our understanding of copyright law. So in relation to what Donald was saying, the law is evolving and a remedy has emerged which has quite a lot of potential for creators of copyright or creators of content to um, go back to some of the protections which were envisaged in the Queen Anne statute and attempt to try and um, get, a, get some revenue from, from their content. Um, I just suggest I'm not going to say anything further, but we've got a, we're publishing a print newspaper for, for NetHui, which has an article about this in it, and we'd love to talk to people about it. Kia ora koutou. Um, my name's Joel Pauling, and i kind of got a bit of a soapbox on some of these issues. Um, I'm going to go back to what Donald was saying about uh, business models a little bit, um, but I'm going to throw something new into the mix here a little bit, and this is more about how content creators are actually recouping their costs from the great sort of market of consumption. And I think a lot of the, the, the business models that exist today, like iTunes or, or um, paid content models like Netflix, they, uh, uh, they're sort of sitting in this intermediary distributor position and, and taking a chunk out of the, 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 the value in that content, which is sort of almost a traditional model. What I'm interested in is how we can actually use the technology that's available to us to recoup um, the, the value in that content from the grey market. That is, I don't care how you got my content. I, I obviously want you to consume my content because it's a good thing for me. Um, and that's what people do. And I think we shouldn't try and stop behaviours that happen naturally in our social environment. And I think the, all these issues are all about sharing information when it comes down to it you, me, our group, our communities, it's about sharing information and we shouldn't be trying to legislate people stopping sharing information. What we do want to do is try and, and recoup some of that value. So this actually is interesting because the thing that's stopping artists at the moment from putting a, a pay me what you think you should pay me button on their web pages because you've listened to a song you like 
is uh, actually money laundering laws. So there's a lot of um, a lot of legislation around where the, where the money is coming in and consuming some sort of thing to, to ensure that you're not just money laundering, essentially. And it's why you can't have a pay me what you like for whatever it was you consumed of mine that you liked on, on your website, because that way there's all sorts of nasty legal things that bad people can be doing. But effectively, that's what we should be doing. You shouldn't care as a content creator how someone got your content. All you should care about is trying to recoup some of that value. Donald. Yeah, this is just to um, follow on from Donald's comment as well. Actually, I've got two points to make. The first is um, I think we have to be very careful about assuming that the internet is causing losses to content creators because um, the, the aggregate evidence uh, doesn't seem to stack up and support that assumption. So if we're talking about somehow protecting or legislating uh, effectively against the internet, then I think we have to be careful that we actually don't kill the goose that is laying a rather golden egg for um, the creation industry. Uh, the point that I want to make, though, as a software developer uh, that relies 100% on copyright to protect our uh, creations, is that actually it's another form of intellectual pro property right, uh, patenting that is allowing third parties to steal our works. And that's not related to the internet at all but it is related to, to copyright issues and technology issues. And I think, you know, any review of copyright perhaps needs to take into account how other forms of IP impact on software development. Thank you. Another quick straw poll for we've been hearing about the business models again. Hands up if you've legally purchased music online. I think almost everyone in the room. Now keep your hands up if you've legally purchased movies online. Around half. And if you've legally purchased TV shows online. Where are they? Which I think are still the most uh, pirated things, the ones that people can't buy online. Um, I think we're back at the back uh, of the room. Nope, here first. Hello. I've just had some stuff going on with the dude over there. I was talking about things. Sorry, I forgot your name. Oh, there we go. Joel. Joel, cool. I'm um, just talking about like content. The dude's good though. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, content creation and selling it and stuff. Um, specifically music through iTunes and everything. Is um, you, There are a lot of available options, you know, with like iTunes and Amazon and stuff, but a lot of problems with that, especially for people who are just starting up, is that you have very little control over what actually happens. Like you give your track or your album away. You know, like there you go, and you can't control like pricing, and you can't control like you know um, restrictions or whatever. Um, and there are a couple of things that are significantly better that are just kind of starting up. Things like uh, Bandcamp, for example, which actually have a pay what you want example. Um, I'm not sure about the sort of legality behind that, but I mean it's it's, a, it's an available option, so you can be like, you know, this is either a dollar or you can pay what you want essentially, which is quite cool. Um, and kind of going along with what someone over there was saying as well, um, just about how if the internet is actually losing profits of, from uh, content creators, and um, I haven't actually looked into like full on like global statistics or anything, but I think as far as artists who are starting up, I think it is quite making a relatively big impact. Um, for example, I just made a uh, uh, released an album. Um, and had like an advertisement on it on my YouTube channel, and the top comment was, um, "Where can I torrent this?" And that had like you know a few hundred likes on top of that. Um, and so, and it, it's kind of it's a difficult thing when um, you've got a full generation of people who have grown up with the internet, and absolutely everything is available to them for free. And why would they purchase it? You know, they kind of like need an extra reason to. And there's so much justification everywhere. You know, you can be like, "Well, I'll pirate this movie because." You know, Tom Cruise doesn't need another million dollars or whatever, which is ridiculous because there are so many other people involved. But, um, yeah, I think it's it. Uh, one real issue, I think, is the length of term of copyright. You heard it was originally 14 plus 14. Now it varies from country to country, but it's well beyond life, and that's one of the things coming up in international negotiations. 
and I'm tempted to advocate that it should actually just be rather the artist is alive until someone pointed out that provides a perverse incentive to assassinate your favourite artist <laughs> so you can then get all their work for free. Um, <laughs> next speaker at the back. Hello. Hello. So I didn't grow up with the internet. Uh, originally my family were too poor to afford even having your standard um, connection. So what I did grow up with was a local library that allowed me to get all my music, movies, and listen to them for free, including books, scientific literature. So there are still local libraries that offer for free all this media. So if we want to place these restrictions on the internet, when are we going to start shutting down and placing the restrictions as well on our local government libraries and schools? Because if we say, you cannot watch something online, shouldn't we also be saying, you cannot watch this in school, you cannot watch this or use it at your local library? And on top of that, if we do start placing these restrictions on this media, and particularly scientific media, as quite happens, we normally also mean that it can't be peer reviewed. And in scientific literature, peer review is the main process we have for assessing the validity of any of the scientific research as well. So. Okay. I think down the back. Oh, Colin then behind and then Lynn again. Yes, David, you asked a question a few minutes ago. You asked several, but the one I'm going back to was what should happen when people illegally download, say, music, films, etc.? What penalty should be exacted? And um, my proposal is quite simple. It is n times the cost of legally downloading it. Two, three, four times, pick a number. So if you go and download a movie um, that you could have got off iTunes for 20 bucks, then you should pay 40 or 50 or 100 maybe. Of course, that does provide an incentive for rights holders to make their material legally available. <laughs> Depends, of course, on the cost of enforcement. Um, ah. So just a quick comment to Camille over here. She was asking yep. about restrictions on um, libraries and digital content. Um, I was quite incensed to find that my flatmate had downloaded, wanted to download some audio books from Wellington City Libraries. And I'm told that this is also in Auckland. It's from a system called Overdrive. Um, and I was quite incensed to find that I had to spend three hours converting these WMA DRM protected content from the library uh, to something that could play on her phone. Um, so just talking to you, when are we going to be starting to do this to our libraries? We already have started to do it. Okay, now the mic's in the middle and then we're going to the gentleman against the wall. Uh, Jeff Dean on University of Waikato. They are in a in, in, in equities, but I think it may be looking in the wrong place because I was rather appalled recently to, to, to hear that for um, iTunes download that the artists get less than the credit card companies in terms of over to overall revenue. An interesting factoid. Um, if we go to the gentleman against the wall and then Lynn, then Susan. Hi there, uh, Mark Stewart, University of Auckland. There's two related terms that I've heard one of them mentioned once today, and that's the only time we've heard it, and that's fair use and fair dealing. And they're, they're terms which I don't think are particularly well understood, and I think that if we're looking at copyright reform, they're terms which need to be better understood. I mean, especially in the education sector, we try and make use of a lot of audiovisual material in our classrooms, and as far as I'm aware, I'm covered under fair dealing statutes, but I'm kind of just operating until I'm told that I'm not doing something right. And I, I think that there's sort of, you know, a lot of misunderstanding about what's covered, depending on which country you're in, which, which jurisdiction you're in, you know, are we, you know, people have a bit of an understanding perhaps of what fair use means in the States, but less of an understanding of what fair dealing means in New Zealand. And I think that any copyright reform, as much as the law perhaps can't be in plain English, there needs to be some form of expert plain English description of what exactly is covered by fair use or fair dealing in New Zealand. In that terms of fair use, people might not think I've got this right, but the US Trade Representative Office has just advocated a policy which would make New Zealand copyright law more liberal 
than it currently is. Now, I'm not suggesting that's a change on everything, but they've actually said they will now push for the US fair use, which includes parody, satire, criticism, to be enshrined in uh, international agreements. And we don't currently have that in New Zealand law. Gareth Hughes, a Green MP, actually has a bill before Parliament if it comes out of the ballot to, to deal with that. So that whole area, I think, of fair use, fair dealing, is one of the, the most critically important uh, for the review to look at. Now, I think we had Lindy and Susan. Um, two particular things that probably annoy me is one is the um, the geographic regions. I mean, you ask the questions, how many people have downloaded, have purchased music online, books online, and things like that. But what you didn't ask, David, is how many people here have tried to purchase a book or movie or music online and found that they couldn't do it because they're in the wrong region? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so, in order to get around that, you had to either steal it by illegally downloading it, or you had to illeg or you had to work a way around to get yourself within that region through some, you know, borrowing someone's credit card, borrowing someone's account, and things like that. Now, why should people who want to legally get hold of this information not be able to simply because they are being ge geographically ringed? And the other one is the fact that you'll find, I find that now publishers, someone spoke about peer reviews, publishers have now figured out that good grief, you know, if they don't get it online, they might not get read. And you find that the academic publishers, I was very surprised to see, has recently put some of their journals online available for free in the open access. Has anyone heard of open access for um, academic publications. Um, they've actually put that online. Now this, from academic publishers who, are you, who in the past have been very protective of their community. So anyway, can we do something about the archaic geographic um, ring fencing, please? Yeah. I have a three strikes policy when it comes to buying content online. I'll try three times legally. I'll try um, iTunes, Amazon, then Googling for it, and if they still refuse to take my money, then um, I go get it anyway. Um, <laughs> that's not being recorded, is it? No. Uh, so, Susan, then the gentleman at the back. Hi, um, I'm Susan Chalmers. I'm from Internet NZ, and I just wanted to build on what Jar Judge Harvey had said earlier. Um, I think that we have a real opportunity uh, in 2013 to make positive suggestions uh, during the review of our Copyright Act. And we're actually fortunate enough today to have um, some personnel from MED in the room who are listening to what we're saying right now. So um, with that said, um, I know that we're not going to talk about TPP uh, in this session. Um, though TPP and the copyright review do relate because if we sign up to the TPP, it could be that some of the provisions that we accept will narrow the scope of that copyright review. Um, so it's really kind of a question between positive suggestions right now and taking defensive okay. measures. Okay. And for more on defensive measures, I would um, invite people to attend the launch of the Fair Deal campaign today at 6.30 because we'll be looking at what is apparently on the table for changes to New Zealand's Copyright Act. Um, uh, but in terms of positive suggestions, I think that while we have the chance, um, if international obligations, for example, require New Zealand to recognize copyright for certain work, works being uh, the life of the author plus 50 years, um, if we can't undo the Berne Convention right now. I think that one positive suggestion we could make is perhaps, uh, sorry, sorry, the Berne Convention requires um, uh, all of its signatories to give uh, authors of copyrighted works uh, copyright protection for the life of the author plus 50 years. And New Zealand is a signatory. And this convention that has lasted is first created in 1889. So it's a longstanding uh, convention. Um, but so if we can't undo that 
uh, that convention right now. Maybe we can just suggest that we refuse to recognize any other extensions, any further extensions of copyright, for example. That could be a positive suggestion. Or that uh, we require everybody uses technological protection measures to explain exactly how they restrict us from accessing ebooks or uh, getting around region coding or all of that. So those are just uh, some thoughts that I want to share, see if anybody else has anything. Th up. Thanks, Susan. We'll go to the back in a second, then we've got three in the middle. I'd just like to acknowledge Claire Curran, who's here today. Claire's the opposition spokesperson on comms ICT. And can I say, Claire's been an absolute great on these issues. She understands them. She's been a huge advocate for the Parliament having more balanced copyright laws, etc. And along with Gareth Hughes, they're the two MPs they think most understand this issue and have been great at um, getting on to Parliament's agenda. So uh, feel free to go and introduce yourself uh, and talk to Claire. She is one of the 121 MPs who will get to vote on um, any law changes that eventually make their way to Parliament. <laughs> well, if there's law changes from TPP, yes. Um, there, then there. Hey, um, my name's Byron. Byron. Um, I just, this is probably a little bit less about copyright and a little bit more about the idea of alternative business models. Um, and I think it's highly dependent on what type of business you engage in. But there's an um, American video games company and I spoke to them recently, the guy was telling me that they were trying to combat rife piracy in Asia um, with some of the most popular titles. And he mentioned to me, well, we, we had this massive problem. So we said, how, what, how can we try and solve this? So they released their own copy of the pirated game into the markets um, and gleamed kind of uh, user data from it. So they did take away some kind of value from that piracy. But alternatively to that, because people were playing their games and loved them but just didn't want to pay for them, they said, how else can we make some money from this? So using their intellectual property, they, t they created a line of merchandise and created a new brand about around brand licensing. And he told me that now, two years later, they now make more money outside of North America from merchandise and sub-brand licensing than they do from their main line of business. Okay. Thanks. After that, uh, if the mic can go to the gentleman in the middle, and then to Nat, then to Daniel at the back. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Tim McNamara. Uh, I'm just reflecting on some of the biases that came out in the previous speaker from the education sector, relating to the fact that there was a person who said, you know, I will use content until I'm restricted, whereas copyright law would sort of have the, 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 the presumptions would go the other way. You're restricted to use until you've been granted rights for reuse. And it's interesting that sort of there's this difference of opinion between, I guess, a societal view and a legalistic view. That I, I thought that was quite interesting. And, sir? I heard a clock. Hello? Yes. Oh, that's better. Um, just following up also on, on what uh, you said and the chap over there about business models, um, I think it's probably important to note that the best price for any goods is what the market will bear. And a lot of the problem with copyrighted material is that people aren't prepared to pay what the content authors are asking. And that's what drives them, in many instances, to uh, pirate it. Um, a lot of people will pay for content if they feel that the price is reasonable. When it becomes unreasonable, they don't. Um, more than that, I think everybody who downloads stuff illegally or copies stuff illegally is actually paying for it one way or another. They just maybe aren't paying the people who made it. Um, Kim.com has probably shown us quite adequately that it is entirely possible to make a lot of money without having to copyright anything. So it's worth thinking about. Thank you. Uh, Nat. Yeah, um, so I'd like to, to point out that we are looking at this change in business models. That the technology is driving it. Technology created the business model of uh, collecting a bunch of songs, putting them onto a piece of dead dinosaur and shipping it around the world. And the in fundamental nature of moving atoms around means they come into ports, you know, these CDs come in, or, or records come into ports and are then regionally distributed, not just around the world, but then within a country to the stores. And so it made sense for there to be a series of middle uh, 
uh, middle men, middle, middle agents, uh, each making a further st step in the distribution possible. And consequently, the, the, media, the media middlemen developed the, the policies, the procedures, the standard ways of doing things with contracts that enshrined all of these steps. So when the technology changes and you're no longer forced to ship things around through all of these intermediaries, the standard operating practice still remains. It's very lucrative. The margins were higher. We had to bundle things together. We were selling more, um, more songs necessarily than people wanted. Now the technology has changed. They're still adhering to those old geographic distribution models the, um, and the ge geographic uh, um, setup of the laws. So I'm really interested in the exception for inaccessible content because I see there's a lot of incentives for uh, companies who distribute content at the moment to try and hang on to the old model, inhibit the new coming in as long as possible because as long as they can uh, make it difficult, ah, oh, well, I guess I'll have to buy it uh, on the CD if I want to buy it legitimately at all. Now, I think every, nobody credits the, um, the consumer's desire not to be a lawbreaker. That most of us, and I would include the digital natives in that, that if you look at the behavior of 14-year-olds and you extrapolate that to how they will be when they're 40, I think it's as wrong for the current generation, uh, it's a, as flawed a model for the current generation as it is for the, um, would have been for us. They, they don't pay because they don't have a lot of money. Right? When they become in their 20s and are earning and have jobs, at least this has been my experience both personally and amongst my peer group, once they start to have a job, once they start to have disposable income, they will dispose of it on your products and your content. Uh, it's simply at the moment, um, when they're 12, that they can't afford to do that. So I'm keen to see that exception for inaccessible content. It's going to be tricky. But I'm also keen to see, before this whole thing is, um, is revisited, a set of common facts established. That I've, I've heard people talking about different things like um, the change that's happening in open access or the amount of money being made through some model and even the conflict over whether pay what you want is legitimate or is legal or illegal. Um, and it seems that until we have some common set of understanding about how the world is now, arguing about what's possible and what's not possible, what works and what doesn't work, is always going to be built on a, a very tenuous platform of supposition, hearsay, and inaccuracies. So I think getting, interjecting some fact and that we can all agree on into that would be a, a lovely start. Okay, thanks, Nat. Uh, we've got around 12, 15 minutes left. We've got Daniel, then we've got three people lined up over here, then we'll go to Joy. I'm geographically segmenting the audience, you note. Um, I, I think, first off, uh, three points. One, I used to run an American record label, and anybody who wants to talk about that topic, please contact me separately here, because I'm happy to tell you that mechanisms used to buy record labels to make sure that artists generally never made money. Whole set of mechanisms in place for that. That's old school. Focusing on new school now. Um, I think copyright under law needs to mimic Creative Commons in recognizing that there need to be a lot of different flavors of copyright to cover the wide variety of situations that creators of content have. You may not want to make money on your content. You may not want to control your content. You may want to maximize your money on your content. But currently, we have one ring to rule them all. Uh, next off, we really need to remember that copyright covers a lot more than movies and music and books. It can cover geographic uh, compiled data. It can cover a wide variety of data. And not all copyright creators are human anymore. And the corporations that own, develop the content live forever. And copyright doesn't contemplate immortality. Thanks. Uh, then we were over here, this gentleman. And then after that gentleman along the row, then Jay, then Joy, and then we'll see if we've got time. Hi. Um, I, yeah, so, um, uh, the point I want to make is, is, is about um, innovation, I think, and um, the way in which um, people uh, are remunerated for being innovators and the, the extension of that um, capacity 
uh, perhaps deservedly to earn more, into a permanent mechanism for, for um, taking money out of, of, of um, a creative system. Um, I, I, practically, I'm thinking about Amazon Books and um, the, 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 the sort of nexus, to use the lady from the FT, FTC's words, um, between um, questions of um, rights and um, uh, digital rights management um, and extending innovation rights beyond the time in which people actually, uh, uh, corporates deserve. Um, we, we know that um, Amazon, for instance, um, is collecting um, uh, behavioral data as we read an Amazon book. Um, the, the mechanism for this is digital rights management. Um, it, it's a cloud device. It's, it, it's not a standalone device. And, um, uh, and the, the, that creates the, the, the connection between privacy and, and, and copyright, basically, um, and copyrights management. Um, I, I feel that um, when we talk about innovation, we should um, look at, uh, more closely at the economics of the, of the business that, that Amazon, I believe, has stolen a march. And, and certainly, it, it, it's a poor example of um, rights management in, in relation to fair use. Um, you can't copy out of a, out of a um, digitally copy out of an Amazon book. Um, you, you can't share it. Um, because the software that, that belongs to the reader is closed down. Um, and you, you certainly can't resell um, your right having purchased it to somebody else. Um, I, I, I guess that's, the, that's a core for me of potential for Amazon, for instance, to completely redefine um, copyright itself um, just through a technological mechanism. Um, and it's certainly not, not being held to account at the moment. Um, in the way that, say, Google and, and Facebook and uh, the rest, w we're a bit behind on that one. I think it's stolen a march on us, um, and I think it needs to be hauled back in. Yeah, that's it. And then the other microphone to Jay, if there's a... Hi, Hi there, my name is Andy Neal, and I just wanted to build off some of the comments about um, fair use. I think um, one of the things that will come up in the review, and it, it might be seen as a kind of a small point, but I think it's important. Um, I think the, the topic of um, format shifting is going to come up again. We've had the conversations about music, but I believe the situation in, in New Zealand and a lot of other jurisdictions is that um, literature isn't covered by, by format shifting. So what that means is that I can't take a book that I've bought, I've, I've legally bought that, and I can't convert that into a digital version um, that I can put on on my device, and what's interesting is that um, we're seeing this most commonly in Japan at the moment. There's, there are services being built up where people are sending book, you know, boxes of their books to be destructively digitized so that they can convert them, so they can read them on their devices. And it, I mean, I work in a library, and that's kind of pretty abhorrent. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a point where um, you know we may you know, there may be some titles where we want to do that, uh, and I feel that the um, the legislation in the area is, is something that's going to have to be reviewed. Uh, Jay? Um, I'd, I'd like to go back and have a look at some of the, the history that uh, David alluded to, because I think there's three streams of history that cover copyright. One is the technology. And I think since the press and the Xerox and everything else, technology's flow has been towards making copier easier, copying easier, and certainly the internet made copying critical to its function. The other stream is the industrial regulation that was copyright, because it used to limit a very small number of people from performing an act that wasn't available to you and me. And I think that goes to David's comments about we all need to take notice of this. It was industrial regulation. We surrendered copyright at a time we could not copy. And that's Richard M. Stallman's line. Now we can all copy, and yet it seems that the legislation that controls copying is being driven uh, by those same industrial organisations that have had the benefit of centuries of monopoly rents 
to build their cases. And as uh, Susan pointed out, the Berne Convention has been around, what, a little bit after papyrus by the sound of it. So I think those are the three streams. Uh, technology's moved one way, the publishers have extended the width, that is what can be copyright, copyrighted, the depth in terms of derivative works that they also control, and the length has just become absurd. I have no objection to paying anybody who gives up part of their life to make my life better. That's just fine. But I'm not paying the dead for 50 years. So I think where we've come to is a point where there's a great big divergence between what the technology allows and what the industrial regulation dominated by large organisations allows. And in that gap, that's where we all live. And unless this review in 2013 is really, really fundamental and, and look, goes back and looks at what we're doing and the context in which we're doing it, because this isn't the statute of Anne anymore, um, it's just going to be a waste of time. And if I'm going to mention time, I've looked on the internet at the history of New Zealand copyright. I think, I can't actually determine, but we've had reviews before. And in fact, the, uh, the most recent set of amendments seem to have been done in a rush because it had been going on and on and on for about five years. So 2013, I don't know when we're going to get a new copyright law, but I'm pretty sure that it's not going to arrive fast enough to catch up with what we, we the consumers, all of us, can do. So I just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Hamish. Jay, then Joy, and then we'll see thanks. how time um, goes. I'm not sure what a copyright fundamentalist is, but I quite like the phrase. I think I shall tell my children that's my new job title. Um, and I, I can only use that phrase if I can also use the opposite phrase, which I think is probably right, a, um, a copyright ultra-nationalist, which would um, best describe Disney Corporation and others. Um, I'm <laughs> slightly worried Russian. that the... Um, copyright ultra-nationalists are managing to get some false memes embedded into popular culture. And I think it's important for us to highlight those and, if possible, exterminate them. Um, the first one being that um, copyright is a right. Um, I don't agree. I think there is a, a right to be asserted as an author of a work, but the rest of it is a state-granted monopoly. And as we know, all state-granted monopolies are subject to corruption. There's no two ways about that. Um, the second one is the deliberate conflation of the idea of getting paid for work and controlling access to work, which is basically all about maximising revenue and is nothing else. And then the third one is that content is expensive to create, which personally, and this is a bit rude, I find self-indulgent. Um, and I wonder if there is a nexus between the money we put into creating content and the lack of meaning in so much of the content that is now being created. <laughs> um, and Joy and just standing up there. Yeah. Thanks. And then down the back, Lynn has had her hand up. Joy Liddy Coat. Um, I just wanted to go back to your original question, David, which was about how we balance um, appropriate interests in, in copyright legislation. And I wanted to go back and, and think about what is in the public interest when it comes to restricting access to content. Um, and I think that we've got much. Um, uh, bigger issues now to think about in terms of how, how we in our communities access content. And I'm thinking in particular about disabled people um, and their ability to change, um, and, uh, change formats in which material is presented so they can actually access it. Um, and I don't believe we've got adequate provision for them um, in our current copyright law, and I think our review needs to take care of that. Um, three other quick points. Um, in terms of uh, our copyright offences, no more criminalising of um, copyright offences. No more um, provision for allowing people to be extradited from countries for copyright offences. Um, I mean, this is completely ridiculous um, that somebody can be a lawful resident of New Zealand and being extradited for crimes which are so-called crimes which are, are acts of speech. Um, and, and finally, I think given what's happened in Europe for uh, the rejection of ACTA, we must review the criminalising of, um, uh, sorry, the uh, offence of, um, sorry, the penalty for 
copyright offences which allows access to be denied or um, accounts to be terminated for repeated violations of, of copyright offences. Um, it's fundamentally flawed, it's, it's wrong, um, and it's been rejected by um, countries which we look to for leadership on, on rights-related issues. So that would be my third plea for the copyright reform. Thank okay, thanks, Joy. We've got two minutes left, so two speakers. One minute, Lynn, then one minute at the front, Rob. Sorry. Um, just a quick, we seem to worry exactly. about life of copyright and things like that, but a lot of the media nowadays is now in digital form. How much of that media can still be readable in 50 years' time in that digital form, considering how formats and file changes has happened? So things that were readable, say, if you had a printed book, you can always read it as long as the book is still in. But if you have a media file, will you still have something, software, that will be able to read that media file in 50 years' time? And if you're, if you're to worry about the loss of that data, what's going to happen to books or movies or songs in 50 years' time when they can no longer be accessible because the media is not there to read them? Should we worry about, should we legislate to make sure that stuff is available in open readable formats so that it's not in some proprietary format that can go away when the business, say, goes bankrupt or sells it to someone else who decides to send it away. Okay, thanks. Sam? Um, from a consumer's point of view, I have a very split perspective on, on copyright. Uh, when it comes to David's photographs, um, I have the utmost respect for not using them illegitimately, and I will make sure you're reimbursed. Don's source code, I want to make sure we get it right, where you respect the license, whatever it happens to be. Uh, Game of Thrones, oh yeah, I'll just pirate that, no worries. Um, I don't know what that is. I think it's because I perceive there are many middlemen in the way clipping the ticket that I don't really care about. I perceive they're making plenty of money already that... If I pirate it, well, who cares? It's just one person stealing that content. And they'll still make plenty of money and no one's the wiser. I think we need to engender respect for copyright uh, for everyone. And I don't think we're, we're getting that and I don't think we have a plan for how we do that with the next generation who are coming through and we'll pirate anything and expect it to be free. Cool. And we just pass the mic behind you or we'll just finish with Rochelle. Uh, I was probably could have been an opening comment, but just following on from what Hamish was saying about if we're going to get back to first principles, do we now look at copying not being the prohibited act, but as some other act, the prohibited act, use, use without attribution, commercial use, is that what we, we stop from being prohibited? Because <clears throat> back when copying was made, um, the prohibited act, it was very, very expensive to copy something and generally only people who were going to make a lot of money out of it mm. bought the equipment necessary, the you know, hugely expensive equipment to actually then copy. And I just don't know what the appetite is for changing that because it's almost impossible to see if you do change it to use what all the ramifications of that will be and what the business models will be. That's a great issue to think about to end on. Um, that means at least caching would no longer get caught up by some of the demands from certain country. Two things just to end on. The first is the review next year is not determined if it's a narrow technical review or as wide as a first principles review, which means people should make their views open to the government about what they think. Um, I tend to think unless it's as wide as possible, we're going to still be debating this in 10, 20 years' time because people want to have that fundamental debate. And the final thing is we have bar camp on Friday. Sony issues have come up here. If you want to keep talking about them, go up to the bar camp agenda, write some issues and topics down there, um, and you can carry that discussion on Friday. Thank you very much for your time. Um, the session has ended. Ah. Thank, you to, um, thank you to David for facilitating the session. Just to